we'll introduce ourselves and you introduce yourselves and your teacher, and then we'll ask the question. My name is John Cousins. I'm an entrepreneur and investor from New Mexico. I'm very much looking forward to discussing these ideas with you. Hello, my name is Tammy McConnell. Uh, I, I'm from South Carolina. I serve as a professor of history in Columbia College in South Carolina for about 20 years, but right now I'm teaching high school with students very much like you. In fact, if any of you guys are taking AP Psychology, well, human geography, <laughs> I know what you're going to be doing in a few weeks. So it's an honor to be here with you. Hi, my name is Alyssa Hanno. I am an alumna of the Lead of People program, uh, and we made it to nationals that year as well, so I remember like it was yesterday sitting in your chairs. Um, I now work and live in Washington, D.C. I am a program manager at the British Embassy. Mi vivo como nieto de un dejiste matrimonio. Hello, my name is Haley Sato, and I live by these words of Democritus, that we should be good not out of fear, but because it is what is right. Menon Tuangucci, Noventos Externos. Hi, I'm Lachan Bailey, and I follow the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, that all that we can control is what's in our mind and not outside of events, and once you realize this, we find strength. Hi, my name is Emily Brechtel, and I live by these words of Montesquieu, that liberty is the right to do what the law permits. S.A.S. Brechepi. Hi, my name is Jay Simon, and I live by the words of George Berkeley, because all that we can truly know is that which we perceive. And on behalf of Unit 1, our advisor Gretchen Wolfang, and Tahoma High School representing the state of Washington, thank you for judging. Well, thanks very much, and uh, this is Unit 1, which uh, deals with philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system, and we are taking question number two. And uh, that is Alexander Hamilton observed that ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more vulnerable than these are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right of the question, the right side of the question. Does Hamilton's observation challenge the effective expression of popular sovereignty? How do our institutions of representation, such as legislatures, strengthen or weaken popular sovereignty? What actions, if any, would citizens take if the government were not responsive to the will of the people? The Commonwealth is but an artificial man, in which the sovereignty an artificial soul, as giving life and motion to the whole body. Thomas Hobbes. Hamilton's observation does not challenge the effective expression of popular sovereignty but rather explain the necessity for it. To answer this question, we must first understand popular sovereignty. The concept originates from Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan, stating that the people must consent to one another to create a working society. The idea that government authority is granted by the people and what rights they choose to relinquish laid the foundation for Rousseau's theory of the social contract, where he states that the government is an intermediary body established between the subjects and the sovereign for their mutual communication. These two philosophers created the groundwork for popular sovereignty, which is the idea that the power of the government must be derived from the will of the people. Whether directly or indirectly, Hamilton's observation has no objection to this concept. He claims that no matter which side of a contentious situation you take, your views will be influenced by the appetites of man. He goes on to say in Federalist I, so numerous indeed and so powerful are the reasons which serve to give false bias to the judgment that we, upon many occasions, see wise and good men on the right as well as wrong side of questions. Because there will always be opposing motivations and good people on any side of an argument, we can never trust to have a single person in charge. So, rather than dismissing the claim of popular sovereignty, Hamilton is here justifying it. By increasing the number of people in power, popular sovereignty decreases the likelihood of evil motivations taking control by mixing in the myriad of motivations of its citizens. Our institutions serve to help popular sovereignty. During the debate on the issue of slavery, the 1848 presidential nominee, Lewis Cass of Michigan, coined the term popular sovereignty as a new solution. The premise appeared simple, but there were many issues with this idea, as no one knew what people had sovereignty over which territories. Under the 10th Amendment, anything not directly delegated to the federal government would be up to the will of the states. The other argument against our institutions serving popular sovereignty is that a representative democracy cannot do so, and rather the only way to secure it is through a direct democracy. However, as Noah Webster writes, a pure democracy is often the most tyrannical form of government because a multitude is often rash and will not hear reason. Seen in the Constitution in Article 1, Section 2, the House shall be composed of members chosen every second year by representatives of several states. 
Our popular sovereignty is enacted through the educated representatives which we elect, leaving the direct political decisions to them. So, while there are arguments to be made that our institutions hurt popular sovereignty, they're based on misunderstandings of the concept and of society's purpose as a whole. The purpose of popular sovereignty is to hold the government accountable. When the government is no longer responsive to the will of the people, people can take action by voting in new representatives, enacting peaceful protests, establishing social media outcries, writing letters to elected officials, and in extreme cases, starting a revolution. Unrestricted governments and bureaucracies are likely to infringe on the rights of the people to follow their own ambitions. As Federalist 51 states, governments with no accountability will likely pursue their own vices. However, holding our representatives accountable purely through popular sovereignty doesn't always work, as they may refuse to listen to the voices of their constituents. When the government places its interests ahead of the people, John Locke writes that the government puts itself into a state of war with the people where it devolves to the people who have a right to resume their original liberties. A revolution is the most extreme way in which people can take back their original grant of power. As the Declaration of Independence reads, if any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Therefore, when the people feel that their social contract with the government has been violated over long periods of time, their actions are justified in their right to resume their original liberties. Thank you. That was great. So Hamilton's, in this question, list the goal of less than laudable qualities. Do you think that that is a pessimistic or a more realistic view of human nature? Personally, I believe that that's a more realistic view of human nature. As Thomas Hobbes once said, that life without government would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutal, and short. And that's because he believed in the state of nature which is where life without government, and thus man just existing with man, would be full of these strifes and inter-man uh, angers as well as vices that each man would act against each other. So he believed that the natural course of man was to be not inherently good. Um, one thing about the, the structure of the, the, the structure of uh, popular sovereignty. Um, okay, oh. Okay, every time I go down to vote, um, I, I vote for congressmen, representatives, and stuff like that, the things that we think of. But I'm also asked to vote for people in, in positions I never really even give any thought to, uh, the, the soil and water district commissioners, uh, even the, uh, the, the mosquito control district, and, and certainly school boards, which we're more familiar with. Uh, those positions that call for expertise and that, that I have no way of judging. Uh, their ability to do that. Uh, would, that be, would those be cases where uh, direct democracy is harmful to good government? Well, this was part of Socrates' biggest critique of a pure democracy, in which uh, inside of the Republic, he explains that he believes that only the intellectuals and the philosophers should be the ones making the decisions for our government, and it was for that very reason, because he believed that the average person wouldn't be able to make the proper decisions when it comes to the examples that he gave. Adding on to my colleague, Mr. Simon, it's also stated in Plato's Republic in the candy shop analogy. He places an empty storefront in front of his viewers and says both a candy, store, a candy salesman and a doctor are looking to buy it. To the common public, the candy salesman would seem like a better choice. He's friendly, he gives out candy to the people. But the doctor, the one who gives the harmful shots, might be better for society in the long run. So going back to your point, these positions of expertise, there's no way for society to know which one would be better, so the society would be uneducated on who would truly help them in the long run. This is also echoed by Plato's peers like Thucydides, who believed that the people were too credulous. I believe that there is nothing more evident than this than the cyclical uh, variation of, of, of governments throughout history as they've got often switched back and forth between tyranny and anarchy, which is to say democracy and other forms of aristocracy or oligarchy. And this was most evidently seen with the Roman Republic, which is where uh, Socrates got many of his critiques from. Thank you. I want to pick up um, a little bit on that metaphor, what's, what's good for society, what's best for them. Maybe taking some of this into an independent sphere. We hear the term in the last several electoral cycles of independent redistricting commissions, for example. Do those work in that or any other issue? Do you think there should be more independent boards making decisions for us? Personally, I believe that independent boards need to be carefully scrutinized, as to be independent in this day and age is to be something that is not seen often. We can see this clearly with our Supreme Court being supposedly an independent, independent body of political authority or political bias, and we can see clearly they decide on party lines. These independent redistrictors 
would have to be thoroughly investigated to ensure that there are no scrutiny, however, or to ensure there are no biases. However, if they get past the scrutiny, I think that there would be an amazing defense against the terrible crime, which, I, which is gerrymandering. The scrutiny that my colleague is referring to is reflected by Montesquieu, who said power should serve as a check to power. These institutions can be a good thing if there are still people to check them. These experts can't just be left alone to their own vices without some sort of counterforce to make sure they stay within what is best for society. To respectfully disagree with my colleague, Mr. Bailey, I believe that sometimes these independent agencies um, should actually go without of this filter, without this filtering, as they can be then subject to the biases of the governments or whatever filtering they're going to. That is why gerrymandering has been such a long-standing issue. They do not know if it should be a government issue where it could be more heavily influenced by the biases of these pol of politicians, or if it should be individual where it could be more in heavily influenced by the individual. However, um, for this reason, I believe that it is necessary that some of these agencies act on their own without this filtering, as this was reflected by Rousseau, who said that the civilized man was a garland of flowers laid, laid over iron chains originally erected to protect their original liberties. <laughs> what do you think is the main reason that America is such a free country? America is a country of freedom and liberty. There is a difference between a country of the free. I actually believe that we are less of a free country and more of a country that has liberty. Freedom is a state of nature. Freedom is a state where if I wanted to go murder my neighbor, I could. Liberty is the protection that protects people from each other while still maintaining these natural rights. It is a social contract, as like I said earlier, originally defined by Rousseau, that causes the people in America to live such uh, lives full of liberty. For instance, in the First Amendment, we can see that while free speech is the champion of America, if anyone across the world thinks of America, they think of free speech. However, there still are time, manner, and place restrictions, as liberty is just freedom channeled within the fact of a similar to what Lincoln said on an address of a sanitary fair, which is that so long as the wolf's freedom does not infringe on the sheep's, sheep's freedom, then that is liberty. To further this point, I believe it is actually because we are not a direct democracy, more the fact that we are a constitutional republic, and that allows the minority to have a voice. This is most apparently evident with our electoral college and our senate and even our supreme court, which is heavily insulated from the biases of the people. Because we do not have that majority rule, which is commonly associated with just a pure democracy, is actually why we are have so much liberty. Uh, in our pursuit of uh, majority rule, uh, we've developed a two-party system. Uh, would we be able to more closely approximate the, 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 the will of the voters, the will of the people, if we had a multi-party system, um, like Britain has, like uh, Israel has, with probably way too many parties? Uh, would that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, as Madison stated in Federalist 55, a pure democracy has no cures for the mischiefs of faction. And I believe that if there are too many parties, it would simply attribute to this polarization and people would not get anything done, and it would just really more attribute to the gridlock issues we are currently facing. Aristotle once defined tyranny as the compound of oligarchy and democracy in their most extreme forms. I would like to point you to the fact that we see this extreme forms of oligarchy as well as democracy in cases like our uh, Senate and House of Representatives, where you see the same group of individuals winning the popular elections inside of their own districts or their own states and just getting reelected so much as to form this oligarchy of these individuals who do not leave the power. If we were to get away from this two-party system, it would decrease the oligarchy by offering people other options that would be able to reflect their views most best while also not sacrificing the opposition party taking the vote by splitting the original party. Well, nothing is, nothing is preventing anyone from starting a new party. We have libertarian parties, third parties. We have a green party. Why not? To find, why do those never seem to get very many people in office? I think this goes back to campaign uh, spending. Seen in the court case, uh, campaign finance of the FEC, the money that is put into these parties to allow them to run is what influences the general population. Going back to what we said earlier about the education of society, people will agree with what they see. They're influenced by this mob mentality. So the, what's preventing these other parties from gaining popularity is the amount of money that they have to put into their campaigns. Respectfully disagreeing with my colleague, Ms. Pressel, I choose to believe that it is something just uh, more better explained as uh, general election theory. Because when one party decides to split up into two or to divide, for instance, the Democratic Party towards the Green Party, any votes that are now directed towards the Green Party are going to be directly taken away from the Democratic Party, meaning that the, blue, the normally blue voters would have to sacrifice their government over towards the red voters if the red voters did not split. So we, can sorry. we can also see that these multi party systems. Great. Super job. Really, 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 really
best of answers for everything. Very well cited, very well uh, sourced, and lots of different philosophers and references to the Constitution and to Supreme Court cases. I've seen, I've seen lots of people sort of pretend to be debating each other up there. And that seems like you're really good. Like, you've got be, you to be duking it out later on these things. Absolutely. Uh, metaphorically, I don't know. But, uh, but you see that your, but your disagreement and discussion seemed real. It seemed like you were really had thought through these issues enough uh, that you'd come to different conclusions. And that was a very profoundly interesting thing to see happen. I, that, I completely agree. That was very evident that you spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours debating this amongst yourselves, practicing uh, as well. You're very polished, clearly. I'm always astounded by uh, units that can memorize your testimonies. Um, but really, I think more than any other team that I've seen this weekend, you per speaking personally, you gave me a run for my money. I was learning things from you, trying to come up with questions that would be challenging enough for you because you so clearly know your material. Uh, that's evidenced in how much nuance you brought to it, the variety of examples and the fit for purpose examples. Um, if anything, I would say you could slow down a little bit. I had a really, you know, you kind of moved on, you know, to the next uh, thought before I could write down the first one, and you don't want to lose your judging panel altogether. Uh, that's the only thing I would have to say. 